Good afternoon, everyone. You may have noticed that the room has got a little bit fuller since the last session. We've been joined by about 120 special guests because in this session, we're going to be celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impacts Research. And really, the, uh, an anniversary, I don't know how many years we should give it, but for climate impacts research and its community as a whole. We're going to start with a very special performance. We're very honoured to have a, a group of musicians from the renowned State Chamber Orchestra of Berlin, the Staatskapelle Berlin. It's called the Orchestra of Change. They're going to be playing us a piece called Klimageräusche, which means climate sounds, and it's been especially composed for this reason. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce the orchestra and the composer of the piece, whose name is Yuri DeMarco, is going to tell us a little bit more about what inspired the music. So, um, yeah, let's enjoy the music and um, congratulations on 25 years. So, hello from us. <laughs> it's really nice to be here. Um, I just thought about, oh shit, I have to speak English, but it's okay. <laughs> I'm not the best English speaker, but I try. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you that you are here, because it's an amazing event, and we want to support it musically, and we uh, thought about how to transfer this um, topic, uh, climate change, into music. And yeah, we, we're gonna go to a, we have a little journey, um, the the piece, um, yeah, consists like different moments of music's history. Like we have pieces from 300 years ago, but we have pieces from now, which I composed. So we have this transfer, and so we we do a time journey through the last th 300 years, uh, where we uh, go to the to, to the earth and look how the climate climate changed, uh, how the ocean changed. And we will come to a result, and this will be a surprise. Have fun.
I want to say thank you, especially to three people uh, today from the Staatskapelle Berlin. Uh, the first is to our composer, Jure de Marco. I think it was a special concert. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the, second, the second is to our video artist, Lillevan. He is sitting behind you and made these wonderful impressions. Thank you, Lillevan. And the third is, uh, again, you all, you are fighting since a long time for this theme and uh, especially uh, represented to Mr. Professor Schellenhuber. Thank you very much for 25 years. Congratulations at the same time. We brought our children here to give you a small present uh, <laughs> representing the next generation. What an amazing start. I'm a bit overwhelmed. <laughs> Can we just thank them once again? That was amazing. Okay, so um, moving on, just for the people standing in the back, if you'd like a seat, there are several seats here at the front, so don't be scared, come and join us, but, you know, feel free to stand. Um, so now we're going to get started with, um, with the other side of the program, and you may or may not be aware that we have two hosts today. So, first of all, we're in the state of Brandenburg, that's, that, um, that's where Potsdam lies, and we're very lucky to be here, and it's sort of the geographical but also emotional home of PIC, of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. So we will have, um, first of all, a welcome note from the Science Minister of Brandenburg, Martina Münch. We're very happy to have here. And that will be followed directly, I won't, I won't come up on the stage again, also by a welcome note from the funder of this, cons uh, this conference and of actually the entire Impacts World series until now, and also a big funder of a lot of the research that goes on in Germany on the topic of climate change impacts and climate change, and that's the... Um, the uh, excuse me, the German Ministry for Education and Research. And so we will be welcomed um, from the Parliamentary Secretary of the BMBF, that's the acronym for, for this ministry, uh, Thomas Rachel. So first of all, welcome Martina Münch and then Thomas Rachel. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's very hard to give just a, a normal speech after such a wonderful birthday present. Thank you very much to the Staatskapelle. And it's called the Orchestra of Change. It's not called the Orchestra of Climate Change, but maybe it has got something to do with it. Thank you very much. And I apologize for just only talking. I didn't bring any videos. I didn't bring any instruments. So you just have to talk to, uh, to listen to my words. Dear Professor Schellenhuber, Dear Secretary Executive, Mrs. Patricia Espinosa, dear President Professor Kleiner, dear Commissioner, Mr. Carlos Moedas, I think he's not yet here, he will be, uh, he will be in, the, in the setting afterwards. Dear Professor Klaus von Klitzing and dear ladies and gentlemen, obviously I'm not the Prime Minister because he's very tall and it's Mr. Wojtke, but I'm the State Secretary of Brandenburg for Science, Research and Culture and this was a special present there for, uh, for me as well because I'm responsible for the culture in this country as well. I'm very gratefully I followed your invitation to today's 25th anniversary of your well-known research institute, Professor Schellenhuber. And I'm very glad to welcome you here in Potsdam. Unfortunately, our Prime Minister President couldn't be here, but he sends you many regards and he congratulates you as well very cordially. 
This year, we are celebrating more anniversaries than ever before, because in 1992, there were as many re-foundations of Leibniz research institutes as never before. The Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research was an exemption because it was the only new founding in old days. As far as I can remember, we had very stormy times and an unsettled period after the reunification, and not everything had gone in the direction we wanted. The PIC Foundation was indeed a very promising one. The success today was unprecedented. I would therefore like to begin the expressing my sincere thanks to Professor Schellenhuber. Mr. Schellenhuber, as Institute Director, has since then set up a research temple for climate impact and change and established high-class advisory to scientists, influencers, and policymakers on a global scale. With a little smile, I would like to add the PIC is located here in Potsdam on the highest point on the Telegrafenberg campus, one of the highest and most traditional scientific places in the capital of Brandenburg. And maybe this is one of the reasons because it was, became one of the highest well-known research institutes in Brandenburg. There's no question, some of the world's most respected scientists come here together, exploring solutions of options for climate change mitigation based on original research. That includes evaluating strategies for adaptation with special focus on an economic and social level. One could say, PIC is an extraordinary and extremely international institute, and extremely successful as well. The work and approaches to solutions are crucial and help to obtain your position globally. You all know PIC stands for the abbreviation of Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Potsdam, the capital of Brandenburg, is part of the full name of the institute and we are very proud of this. The city of Potsdam and the state of Brandenburg are proud of such a scientific campus. The PIC today is part of a new ecosystem of science and research that explores a huge spectrum of IT, media science, energy and climate based all on original research. Word has got around by now that the international scientific community regards Berlin Brandenburg with Potsdam, of course, as one of the most promising scientific hubs worldwide. And if we take the, all the research institutes and the University of Berlin together, I think this is really true. PIC's research work with its fundamental knowledge of dynamic processes in the Earth system is priceless in that community. What is important on a 25th anniversary is to look back to recent year years. Researchers in natural and social sciences at PIC have won silverware on a global scale. The Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research today is one of the world's most influential and highly rated think tanks to study global change and its impacts on ecological, economic and social systems. The Institute is a member of the Leibniz Association and receives top marks by its uh, evaluating. What's going on here now? Sounds like an alarm. <laughs> in a few days, Professor Schellenhuber will be awarded with a prodigious Blue Planet Prize in Tokyo, Japan, for this con the considerations of Earth system processes and uh, breaching the two centigrade uh, uh, line. Many congratulations once more to this wonderful prize, and I think you deserved it very much. Congratulations. <laughs> I would also like to mention the board of directors with Professor Edenhofer, the deputy director and chief economist at PIC. In addition, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all natural and social researchers at PIC who work closely together with other scientists from all over the world to study the Earth system's capacity for withstanding human interventions and to devise strategies for a sustainable development of nature and humankind. Exemplary Professor Ramsdorf has this year been awarded with the Prize for Climate Communications of the American Geophysical Union. This is quite unusual for a German scientist, as far as I know. 
The younger generation of scientists at PIC is also motivated and eager to climb the ladder because you are really uh, the ones who are at the top and they want to reach there as well. And I'm here referring to Professor Ricarda Winkelmann. Where, where is she? No? Clear? Oh, we are in the back. <laughs> she won this year's Outstanding Early Career Scientist Award of the European Geosciences Union. And this is another very popular and prestigious award to young scientists. Congratulations to you as well. I am grateful and feel honored to accompany the following changes of your institute. These challenges include evaluating transformation pathways to global sustainability. One of PIC's research domains is developing sustainable solutions. This, inclu this, this includes advisory for analysts, influencers, but all the more for us policymakers. And we just recently got to know that Germany is going to miss his 2020 aim towards the two degrees centigrade um, uh, reach. And I think, Professor Schellenhuber, your advice is needed more than once, especially in our state of Brandenburg as well, because we are part of this problem. And that's, we are glad that you are here. The, today, it is crucial to understand climate change and its dangerous impacts on Earth and humankind. There's no doubt. And it is a huge task we all have to tackle. We need constructive and sustainable solutions based on original research and data. Possible solutions and options have to be realistic and comprehensible for the population as well. However, PIC generates its fundamental knowledge for sustainable development through smart data analysis and thus develops a better understanding of regulatory regimes to implement possible mitigation measures on all levels, the global, international, but also national and regional level, and this is very important. People all over the world, especially those in rural areas, have to be involved in that processes at an early stage. The state of Brandenburg and the German Federation have jointly helped establishing a climate think tank with an interdisciplinary approach on an international level with co-funding of about 11 million euros. The historic buildings of the Institute on the Telegrafenberg and its high-performance computer are now located on Potsdam's wonderful Telegrafenberg campus. The PIC, as a member of the Leibniz Association, one of the world's prime examples of global climate research and located in Potsdam, has an eminent important value for the federal state of Brandenburg. We, a state of Brandenburg, stand for full but qualified support for this excellent institute, of course, in the future as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Schellenhuber and members of staff of the PIC, I am very honored and would like to express again my sincere thanks for your outstanding scientific work and international performance in the past 25 years. If I had a wish, I would be thrilled to have you all back here in 25 years again to celebrate the 50th anniversary and, who knows, with presenting some more award-winning attendees and perhaps this prophecy. The two-degree line will not be breached as from now. Thank you for attention and thank you all and all the best for the next 25 years and once more congratulations and keep on going. We really need you and your research. Thank you very much. Dear Ms. Münch, Executive Secretary Espinosa, uh, dear Professor Schellenhuber, Professor Kleiner, Professor von Klitzing, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to convey on behalf of the national government in Germany and on behalf of the Ministry for Education and Science here in Germany to you, Professor Schellenhuber, and your entire staff, congratulations on the 25th anniversary of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Let us look for a second back. 1992, the year of the foundation of PIC, 
was also the year of the Rio Earth Summit on Sustainable Development. 100,000 delegates from around the world met in Rio. They discussed about solutions to hunger, poverty, global environmental destructions, and the growing gap between rich and poor. This came only a few years after the publication of the first assessment report of the IPCC. Today, the Rio summit is considered the starting point of international climate policy. In 1995, the parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change came together in Berlin for the first climate conference, for the first climate change conference. This was chaired by Angela Merkel, who was the federal environmental minister at that time. What followed were ups and downs for climate diplomacy in places such as Kyoto, Bali, Copenhagen, and Lima. Finally, in Paris, two years ago, for the first time in history, we achieved a legally binding international framework for climate protection, climate adaption, and climate finance, the Paris Agreement. The Paris Climate Conference was not, was not only a political milestone, it was also a major success for climate research. A huge amount of climate data, studies, analysis, as well as another four IPC assessment reports had been published over the 25 years before the agreement. These all laid the foundations for the political decisions that were taken in Paris. That was a historical context of the foundation of the PIC. It also explains how PIC developed into what it represents today. An international recognized pioneer in interdisciplinary climate research, a trailblazer for global sustainable issues, and active and also passionate contributor to political debate. Natural and social scientists at PIC have been working hand in hand since the foundation of the institutes. They are looking into global climate change and its ecological, economical, and social impacts. Together, they are working on solutions to problems that are too complex for a single discipline to work on. I would like to ask you, Professor Schellenhuber, to accept my sincere praise on behalf of all the staff of the PIC for your extraordinary commitment to sustainability. Your institute deserves the greatest respect to having been a continuous source of interdisciplinary research over now 25 years. For many years now, you have been setting standards with a simple and yet chilling message. Credible climate policies must always be based on research findings. Thanks to your essential contributions, climate research has successfully provided policymakers with research findings that they can process. This is especially due to the exemplary IPCC approval process to which PIC has contributed actively and substantively. Unfortunately, we are now also witnessing support from political approaches that ignore or distort research findings. Ladies and gentlemen, the research community, you, the research community needs to be very clear about their resistance against such tendencies. <laughs> Modern societies, um, Modern democracies are knowledge societies. It's this mindset that has been determining our way of thinking in science and education since the days of Leibniz and Kant. All policies should be based upon up-to-date knowledge and research findings. In short, it is the fact that counts. And it is first and foremost the duty of research policy, as well as science, 
to draw our attention to this time and again. Those who ignore these facts will fail in the long term, and they are risking the well-being of our societies. Only those who face the challenges to find solutions to them will be successful in long running. Germany's federal government has, be emb has embarked on this road. We adopted uh, the Climate Action Plan 2015, November 2016. It provides the guideline principles for a fundamental change of direction in our economy and society. We see climate protection as a strategy for modernization and investment program that promotes innovation and enhances Germany's position in international competition. It is partly due to the modeling carried out by PIC that we know time horizons of 30 years or more may sound long, but it's really little time compared to how far we need to reduce emissions if we are to limit global warming to a maximum of 2 degree or better to 1.5 degree. However, such long-term economic and social change cannot be pushed through hastily. This is true for both technological and social development. We also continue to need an open political debate about suitable means to achieve our ambitious climate goals. This deb debate also needs to have a scientific basis. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in a world where climate agreements are being questioned. In these turbulent times, international cooperations in research is needed more than ever. New strategy partnerships are more important today than ever before. In July 2017, Minister Wanka and her French counterpart, Frédéric Vidal, introduced a joint fellowship program in the context of the French initiative known as Make Our Planet Great Again. The new program supports excellent researchers of all nationalities who are helping us towards achieving our climate goals by working on energy, climate, and earth system research. The Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research um, also plays an important role in international cooperation. Together with my ministry and in cooperation with the partners from Australia, it is currently setting up a German-Australian research alliance which will last, I would say, at least 10 years. As a political representative of our government, I hope that the PIC will continue to be a constructive partner in the important dialogue between science and government. Only in this way, we can pave the way for climate research to have an effect on policy making in the future as well. Our Federal Ministry of Education Research funds the Institute with over 6 million euros annually, thus provides you with planning security for your research. In addition, we are currently providing around 10 million euros in project funding to pick. This money is well spent as an investment in excellent climate impact research here in Potsdam. I would like to call upon you as representatives of this research. Stay critically and stay innovative. And above all, never forget to raise the independent voice of science. My ministry will continue to rely on the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impacts Research in this spirit. I wish you a very success in finding the great challenges of the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you both to Thomas and to Martina for that very warm and informative and considered welcome. We're now going to hear from the founder and director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, John Schellenhuber, and he's, um, you should know he's the inspiration for many things, including for this com conference series. So I think about uh, five years ago we started thinking about what we could do, and this is the second edition, and I think you'll agree that um, we're really moving and shaking something. So, welcome. Thanks. 
So thanks, Leela, for the introduction. Um, I hope my presentation will come up soon. Let's see. But before I refer to that, uh, let me just say uh, our press uh, department ran a series of quota or quotations, however you call it, on the 25th anniversary. And I was asked, of course, to provide a quotation. What does it mean, 25 years of pick? And I said, well, when I was asked to found PIC in 1991, actually, and it started officially in 1992, I said, I thought by myself, actually, well, in 25 years, PIC will not exist anymore. Why? Because either it turns out that this climate idea, what sounded like a fairly crazy idea, is humanity really changing the climate, are there really serious consequences and so on. It might have turned out after 10, 15 years that this is just a minor challenge and we can forget about it. Let's shut down the institute and move on to better things. I could go back to fundamental physics and do some reasonable research there. Or the world would have recognized, actually, that this is a major challenge, a civilization threatening challenge. And then, of course, after 25 years, we would have changed our course, we would have delivered the transformation needed in order to solve the problem, and the Institute could also be shut down, maybe with a lot of applause and whatever. It turns out that neither of these things has happened. Climate change is still with us, and it seems a bigger challenge than ever, definitely. And the world hasn't solved the problem. We are, in a way, on course now to produce some solutions, but we are under attack, as Mr. Rachel, you have referred to, for example, and Minister Munch, you have referred to the regional context. Uh, we hear so many voices to say, well, science is one thing, economy is another thing, social issues are different, there is no solution. Let's just try to carry on, to muddle through. We will somehow manage, we will be fine. That is not true. So, let me say first of all, I'm, I'm, I feel deeply grateful for you who came, I mean, everybody here in the audience, but in particular, those who are now at the frontier. So let me just uh, say I was deeply touched by this world-class performance by Staatskapelle Berlin, Orchestra of Change. This was a world first. I mean, you have never heard this in this combination, nor did I. It was fantastic, really. Yeah. So, my friends, thank you so much. Uh, I'm very grateful, Minister Münch, that you came here and gave this extremely encouraging speech, as well as State Secretary Rachel. Uh, Your Excellency, Patricia Espinosa, you were once an ambassador for Mexico to Germany. She was the person who actually Safe the two degrees target in Cancun in 2010, COP 16, I guess it was. I've almost given up to count down the, all the COPs, you know. Uh, and now we are facing, I guess, COP 23, but Patricia actually is the, the president of the conference. After the depression, the deep depression we faced in Copenhagen, really saved the day and uh, in an ingenious way. Only history will tell, but uh, we actually were able in the end to struggle on and finally strike the Paris Accord, uh, which is, I think, a historical turning point. Uh, I'm very glad that my president is here as well, Mr. President, Matthias Kleiner. He will address us a little bit later, the Leibniz Society, the Leibniz Alliance, however you call it. Uh, Leibniz Association is the right uh, <laughs> title. Uh, 
But in German, you know, Gemeinschaft sounds so much nicer and warmer, so let's stick with that. And I'm extremely glad that Klaus von Klitzing, Nobel Laureate in Physics and uh, the Quantum Hall effect, I recall very well his speech in Münster at the Frühjahrstagung of Deutsche Physikalische Gesellschaft. And he's also my colleague actually at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, I will refer to that. So it's a big honor to have you here. And we will hear also a video message from Carlos Muedas, whom I advise currently on a high-level panel. He would have loved to be here actually, uh, but he's on an official mission. But uh, we will hear about. So my title, originally in the program was announced as avoiding the unmanageable and managing the unavoidable slogan I invented some time ago, actually at the Belgium Academy of Sciences in Brussels. But uh, I decided to just skip that and to give you a different presentation today. So that's part of the surprise. Uh, I rather used the first one for the introduction. I will not take it will not take long. I will not uh, sort of uh, exhaust uh, a lot of your time. Uh, just a few reflections, actually, because as my predecessors already mentioned, when in 1991, when one thought about reshuffling, resurrecting, if you like, the, the science system in the eastern part of Germany, uh, when, of course, one tried to save the good things that have been developed Parts of that were world class, clearly, but you had all the ramification, you know. It was a system which was not democratic. You had to purify it, to sanitize it in a way. Lots of personal tragedies involved, also at my institute, actually. Yeah? But one new idea really emerged during that debate. Let's have an institute about climate change, really. Yeah? And the idea was to have it as an institute that does basic research, but also provides advice to the stakeholders, the policy makers, whether in industry, in policy, and so on, in civil society. So I'll just uh, constrain myself to three keywords which crossed my mind when I sat down in 1991 to write a founding concept for the Institute. And by the way, this is just an anecdote, but I was not involved in the first meeting of the founding committee, which was chaired by my highly admired colleague, Klaus Hasselmann, who is the godfather of climate science in Germany. And uh, the first meeting, obviously the people in the committee clashed namely the natural scientist and the social scientist. Yeah? And uh, so, in a way, this was uh, a quite chaotic stage. So, when I was asked to come in and to provide a concept uh, at the second meeting here in Potsdam, I think in November, something like that, this was a dreary day. And I'd worked very hard on that concept. And uh, when I presented it to the committee, I thought now we will have a heated debate, it will take six hours and then people would say, no, that's not good enough. And to my big surprise, everybody said, this is wonderful, we are done. Now it's your job, we just will go home uh, and wish you good luck and otherwise uh, you will have to do it. Uh. So I'll show you actually uh, the original architecture now of the Potsdam Institute. So let me go on. Interdisciplinarity. That was a keyword. Now, every today at Sunday speeches or at National Academy, everybody is very fond of interdisciplinarity. Yeah? It says this is the way we have to tackle modern problems. Um, but of course, in a way, at that time, I thought the real science, the excellent science, is in traditional disciplinary context, of course, while interdisciplinary is only for the second-rate scientists. Eh? These people forgot, for example, that Albert Einstein, who clearly was a good scientist, 
I have the big privilege to work in the office where the field equations were solved for the first time. And, but very few people know that he also was the inventor of a refrigerator together with Silas. And you can still look up the patent row in Charlottenburg. There's a certain number to that. And this refrigerator really worked. It was best in class for many years, actually. Yeah? So you see interdisciplinarity at work. So I show you what my original setup was. In German, the Gründungsarchitektur of Pekka. Because I'm very fond of Romanesque architecture, this looks like a basilica, of course, eh? and you can see. And uh, data and computation is actually in, in German, the Führung of the basilica. And you had management, but you had climate science, you had ecosystems research, you had social sciences, and you had environmental economics. So this was a, a university in a nutshell, but dedicated to uh, climate change, climate impacts, climate change mitigation, actually. Yeah? And the original idea was just to populate with various departments, the basilica, in a way, the cathedral. Uh, so you pick a few psychologists, you pick a few economists, you pick some physicists, mathematicians, even communications people. Uh, put them all together and you will have a wonderful church, whatever you call it in the end. Uh, and somehow this came about, but in a way I did not expect, actually. But what happened, and this is now going back to the traditional indicators of what a brilliant and excellent research institution has to deliver. Is, let me see. Uh -huh, now I'm somehow stuck. Here we go. Um, this is... Uh, we are all of course, extremely fond, even obsessed, of metrics in science. So this is ISI publications by PIC. You see, starting the citations here, and you have also the publications, some 2,700 now in, in peer-reviewed journals. But interesting is clearly, you know, this uh, curve of citations, and it is now reaching this year, we assume, 20,000 citations of PIC work, 20,000. Uh, in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, that's a lot. And uh, we did not expect this to ever happen. But this is the distribution. We, we now have four departments, and they are not the social department, the biology department, whatever. It's now organized according to the IPCC logic. So you more or less have the Earth System Science, uh, the first department. The second is about climate impacts and uh, adaptation, things like that. And the third one is about climate solutions, if you like. Uh, and where is a fourth one, and this is my personal responsibility, because when, a long time ago, when I was a fundamental physicist, I worked in particular in nonlinear dynamics, uh, complexity science, as we call it today. Uh, and bringing these things together, complexity physics and climate change, was always my ambition. So we put together an institute that is dedicated entirely to advanced, wacky concepts even of uh, understanding complex systems. Uh, and as you can see, they are even more successful than the other ones in terms of productivity and so on. Uh. So for example, we probably have now developed methods to tell in advance much better than the traditional methods uh, when the Indian summer monsoon will emerge, when it will retreat, when will we have an El Nino year, and so on. And these are extremely sophisticated concepts from nonlinear dynamics. So, complexity is the other keyword, clearly. Now I will also show how I approach complexity in 1992. So at these days, although I had worked with a, at that time, supercomputer for performing and the end concluding my PhD in, in physics, uh, 
I mean, we did not have all these cool and fancy instruments to produce uh, sort of charts, maps, whatever. So I set out with a stack of paper in my office at that time, and I used 50 different color pencils, actually, to produce this here. <laughs> this was my approach to climate impacts, really, starting with clearly change in the atmosphere, and when getting down till migration, conflict, all these things. Uh, these are, of course, only the first order effects. Uh, so if I would have uh, sort of tried to indicate all the ramifications would have been much bigger, actually. And so it's the climate impacts cascade. Uh. What later emerged is, well, let me see. Okay. Here we go. Now this is a map that is much simpler in a way, but has become an icon of, of climate system science in a sense. These are, if you like, the vital organs of the planet, uh, of the climate machinery, the so-called tipping elements in the Earth system. We had a very influential paper, the first author was my friend Tim Lenton, uh, on these elements that will be changed, transformed by climate change, like the jet stream organizing our weather patterns here on the northern hemisphere, the monsoon systems, the big ice sheet, and so on. This is complexity in reality, and the interactions between these tipping elements is one of the great, great challenges of science, of contemporary science, actually. So that's about complexity. And finally, and my predecessors in their speeches have already referred to, I'm very grateful to that, because in particular what you said, uh, Mr. Rachel, uh, it's not self-evident that science has the liberty to think about everything we want to think uh, and to tell community, uh, tell society what the solutions might be. In the end, in a democratic process, Society has to decide which options will be chosen in the end. Uh, but the chosen have to be exposed clearly, and we have to shine the brightest possible light on that. This is our responsibility. So I wrote a book about that. My, in a way, it's an autobiography, also how PIC was founded. Now, for all of you um, who do not understand German, because it's only available in German so far, you should not be sorry about uh, not being able to read it because it has 777 pages. Eh? So it's quite a challenge, of course. Eh? Nevertheless, I think it's an interesting book. But the responsibility of climate science came to the fore, actually, on that day. It was the 18th June in 2015 at the Vatican, where I was asked by Pope Francis to present the encyclical Laudato Si, the care for our common house or home, La Casa Común. This encyclical, which was not just an ecosystem and climate encyclical, it was a social encyclical, of course. Yeah? And together with Cardinal Turkson, I had the honor to present it to the world. And later on, last November, Klaus von Klitzing was there too. So let me see. So this is, this is a picture where you can see Pope Francis in the middle. This was a meeting of uh, the general meeting, the general assembly of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, where you see Stephen Hawking on the right hand side, many Nobel laureates. Uh, and Pope Francis gave a very impressive speech. So this was the address of Pope Francis to the Academy of Sciences to that session. Huh? And in particular he said, of course you scientists should do your very best to discover the laws behind the dynamics of climate change, ecosystem degradation and so on. Huh? Shine every light you have to discover the, and uncover the truth. But you also, you also should help to develop a cultural model 
that helps to face the crisis of this planet and to overcome that crisis. So this is much more than just do what you have been trained to do. No, you should also address society. You should help to co-produce the solutions to overcome our planetary crisis. Eh? This were very important words. And whether we scientists are really up to this challenge, I don't know. We can only try. But we should never take it for granted that we have this wonderful privilege and liberty to pursue our curiosity. It also comes with an obligation. It comes with a responsibility. It comes with the responsibility to serve society best, the best we can, actually. Yeah? So thank you all for being here. Thanks for your support. It's very important. I do hope, actually, that the Potsdam Institute will not be needed anymore in 25 years from now. That would be a celebration for everybody. But uh, on a minor note, I yesterday had to appear on national public TV in that was, I think, the lowest point of my media career so far and uh, was confronted with people who just ignore the facts uh, of science. So maybe we will see the Potsdam Institute to be alive for another 100 years, but I hope that will not be the case. Thank you very much. We now have the honor to be addressed by Pat Patricia Espinoza, who is the executive secretary and really the driving force behind the UNFCCC. Thanks, Patricia. Dear Professor Shell Huber, Madam Minister, uh, Mr. Staatssekretär, Dear friends, uh, Professor Dr. Kleiner, Dr. Klintzig, I am indeed very honored and humbled to be able to be here today with this very wise, important, high-ranking audience. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to speak with you today. And it is indeed always a pleasure for me to come to beautiful Potsdam and to visit Professor Schellhuber. And um, especially today, uh, on the occasion of the 25th uh, birthday of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact. Um, it's difficult to express to Professor Schellhuber and all the members of the PIC, how in, in simple words, how important the contribution of this institution has been for humankind. In terms of the United Nations, I can tell you that without your work, without your dedication, what we are doing today, the efforts that the international community is doing together to address climate change would just not be possible. So thank you very much. And I think that um, it is indeed uh, very well deserved that Professor Sean Hoover is receiving in just a few days the Blue Planet Prize. I think um, it's a well deserved recognition. I think also it is a very timely recognition at a moment where we in the world, in the international community, are facing a lot of um, um, threats, questions uh, regarding uh, the science of climate change and what we should do about it. So congratulations, Professor, and uh, I trust that you will organize a big party for everybody here in, uh, when, uh, when you have received the prize.
So the, the PIC is, of course, uh, one of the very important partners for the uh, UN Secretariat on Climate Change. We are looking forward to continuing this very, very, very strong um, relationship in the coming years. It has been already mentioned that 1992 was a pivotal year. It not only was the year that uh, the peak was created, it was the year when the world came together in the Rio Earth Summit to address, for the very first time, the threats to the environment. At that important conference, um, three agreements were reached. One of them was to establish the uh, UN Climate Change Secretariat was the adoption, through the adoption of the Convention on Climate Change. This uh, convention led later on to the Kyoto Protocol and just a couple of years ago, almost two years ago, to the Paris Agreement. In these 25 years, governments have come and gone but the science underpinning climate change has been a constant companion. The challenge now is not the past, but the future, a future that will be defined, and we see this every day, by the impacts of climate change. So today I want to talk to you about how we can work together to help people better understand the human cost of those impacts many of which we are already witnessing. The purpose of this conversation is to boost climate action at all levels in every corner of the world. We do have some good news. There is progress. The Paris Agreement was no doubt one of the biggest multilateral accomplishments in history. After two decades of of negotiations, of moments where it felt like it would not deliver, it would not really come to something meaningful, the world finally came together to agree to a new development path for all people. Because this is what the Paris Agreement is about. It's a new development path. It's not, we, we speak many times about the Paris Agreement, about adaptation, reduction of emissions, but it is really about changing our society. This, agreements, this agreement has broken all records since. It came into force less than 12 months after its adoption. When people were negotiating in Paris, they were thinking it will come into effect maybe in 2020. Well, no, it came in, uh, it, it, it was ratified uh, by enough countries uh, that represented a big amount, a majority of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions in less than one year. And to date, less than two years since its approval, 168 out of more than 190 parties to the agreement have ratified it. So governments have shown their commitment to address the challenges of climate change, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it's in the interest of their citizens and their economies. And this is the most important part. It's not, nobody is forcing uh, governments to commit to this. Governments are doing it because they know it is going to, be, to solve problems for their communities, and it is going to create opportunities for their businesses. So we, we already see the influence of the Paris Agreement in the expansion of carbon markets, in the competition to capture the electric car market, in the exponential rise of wind, solar, geothermal, and other clean energy sources, in the commitment by pri private businesses pledging to go 100% renewable across their operations and more. This momentum is significant. We need to acknowledge it, but at the same time, we need to be clear that it is not enough. So Paris has put us on the right path, but we are still behind the climate curve. We need more action, 
more ambition, and we need it now. But this change will only happen if the average person demands it from their governments, from the businesses in their communities, from financial institutions, and more. That's why I'm pleased that one of the goals of this conference is to foster interaction between scientists and civil society. Because if we are really to achieve our Paris objectives and increase ambition, we must communicate better with the public about the science and impact of climate change. Scientists speak the language of specialized data, which is crucial to governments in the development of policy. It is not, however, the language of the average person. If scientific information is to truly make a difference, if it is truly to spur action, people must, must do more than simply understand it. They must be able to relate to it. And by the way, this is why I also found the presentation by the artist today so amazing. It is art makes people relate to the issue. It's not only understanding it, it's really relating to it. So my congratulations to the wonderful um, artists. We see this right now with respect to the extreme weather events affecting almost every continent throughout the world. Whether it's the hurricanes in the Caribbean, the drought in the Sahel, the will fires in Western North America, we saw California this morning already, it's observably clear to many that the impacts of climate change are happening right now. It's at this critical intersection where scientific and observable evidence meet that we must concentrate our efforts and conversation. Your expect expertise, your influence and credibility carries enormous weight and can make a significant difference in that conversation. But we must speak in a language that people understand. An example, all of us here understand that the contributions we're we have currently received from countries under the Paris Agreement are not enough to keep gold, the goal temperatures under two degrees Celsius. But what does that really mean to people? On the surface, a two degree rise to many may sound like not very much, but it does make an incredible difference. It means the end of tropical coral reefs. It means significant failure of important crops. It means ocean rise. It means the end of life as we know it on some low-lying islands. But I feel the average person is not yet getting the message about those impacts. Not enough to pressure their representatives to increase ambition. We need to be blunt and honest about what is happening as the Secretary General Guterres was last week when he was in, in Barbuda to see the impact of Hurricane Irma. What he saw really moved him. He said, and I quote, the link between climate change and the devastation we are witnessing is clear. And there is a collective responsibility of the international community to stop this suicidal development. And for that, it is essential that the Paris Agreement on Climate Change is fully endorsed and respected, but also to recognize that the commitments made in Paris are not enough." End of quote. So when I talk about getting out the impacts message, I'm talking about using language that is scientifically accurate, but honest, clear, and unequivocal. We must be able to answer questions such as how exactly are people impacted in any given climate change scenario? What is the human cost of those impacts? What is the legacy to those impacts? What stories and examples do we have? And most of all, how does this or could this affect the average person? And what can they do to change it? We need to ask the right questions, but also use the right words. Some of you are already working on that, like the example 
for instance, of the guide regarding the 10 essential things you need to know about climate change. But we really need your help to translate the scientific language into words that everybody at all ages and regardless of their education level can understand. For example, terms such as climate resilient development, climate neutrality, or even the word transition. What do they mean to the average person? What exactly? And how do we communicate with those who fear transition, who fear that we're going into a scenario that we don't know, so we better stay with the old uh, society as we know it. So um, the, the, these very real fears are there, and it's very human, but there are some people that capitalize on them and then progress gets delayed. So I believe we must be firm in our convictions, convictions, but compassionate in our approach. And we must never forget that our struggle is not about ideology. It is about time and it is about well-being of people. We must present the facts, state the urgency, and provide clear evidence about why change is necessary at all levels by all people. And let me share with you that this struggle about communication and how to speak about this issue is something that we also have inside the house, inside the UN system. We need to stop, at the UN, we need to stop talking among ourselves. We need to, to create narratives that everybody can understand. And that's a, a struggle, and I, I can tell you there is fear to transition, there is resistance to change, but we will continue to try. So this is also the challenge when it comes to climate change negotiations, the next round of which will begin in a few weeks at COP23 in Bonn. Very few people understand what these negotiations are all about. We need to explain that the Paris Agreement was both an end and a new beginning. In Bonn, at the COP, we urgently need progress, at least in three key areas. First, it is critically important that the agreement becomes fully operational. That means having a clear set of guidelines to all countries that will be working on that basis. Second, we need to get ready for our first major stock taking after Paris, which must be accomplished by next year. This is how we will know whether countries are practicing what they pledge and how much we need to raise ambition, how far we are from, from our goals. Third, we will be encouraging governments to transform their nationally determined contributions, nobody knows, nationally determined contributions, into blueprints for investments and other actions. You can help us advance these goals by providing the science needed to keep policymakers focusing. You can also remind them why it's important they make significant progress in Bonn. Finally, there's another area of communication that we need to focus on, and that is how we talk about opportunity, because that's a significant part of the climate change story as well. In other words, how can we best communicate the message that taking action on climate change helps build new economies, new technologies, new jobs, new futures? For example, the publication Better Business, Better World recently reported that putting the Sustainable Development Goals at the center of the world's economic strategy could open up to $12 trillion of opportunities and increase employment by up to 380 million jobs by 2030. This includes critical economic sectors such as energy, health, urban growth. And how do we talk about the opportunities that exist with respect to innovation? This is another area where science plays a significant role. So this message of hope and optimism is vital. 
Just as people are moved to action when they see the negative impacts of climate change in their personal lives, they are equally motivated when they see how they can benefit by building a cleaner and greener world. Our message of opportunity must, therefore, be as blunt as our messages about the challenges we face. As you see, we have a lot of work ahead. So, in conclusion, because I think I've taken too long, um, I just want to encourage you to continue to work in this area and um, to know that in the Climate Change Sec Secretariat of the United Nations, you can count with a partner that is dedicated and willing to uh, liaise and to work together with all of you. And thank you, Professor Shen Hoover. Please continue to do this great work. Thank you, Patricia, for that very informative and insightful talk. Um, that was actually very well in time. So. We now have the honor to hear from Matthias Kleiner. He's the president of the Leibniz Association, or I thought maybe we could call it the Leibniz Community. It's a bit warmer, yeah? Okay, the Leibniz Association has uh, over 90 institutes throughout Germany which it supports, and we're going to hear from its president now. Sehr geehrte Frau Ministerin, liebe Frau Münch, sehr geehrter Herr Staatssekretär, lieber Herr Rachel, dear John Schellenhuber, dear Ottmar Edenhofer, Your Excellency, Mrs. Espinosa, dear Professor von Klitzing, dear participants of the Impacts World Conference, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good evening or good afternoon is written in my manuscript. So good evening. <laughs> All this that we may in common celebrate today for this auspicious occasion and that you, dear conference participants, can join this exciting conference, all this would probably not have been possible at this specific time on that day last week. At least the Berlin and Brandenburg people among us know what I'm talking about. Uh, on Thursday, a week ago, the public transport came to a standstill due to the storm Savi that raged across northern and northeast Germany. I cannot remember an occasion where people in Berlin were forced to walk home as they were that day. Maybe some of you have seen the pictures of fallen trees on rails and roads alone in the state of Brandenburg, uh, I think Two million trees, two million trees were overthrown. Moreover, several people were injured and uh, seven people even died. This is less to say in relation to the hurricanes we have seen during the last weeks and now again in Central America. Both of these extreme weathers uh, are only two recent examples of how important climate research and climate research uh, on the impacts of uh, this is today. And maybe, John Schellhuber, I when you talked about your talk show yesterday evening, I have heard of it, I have, have not seen it, uh, unfortunately. I remember, I remember a meeting some month ago in Washington. I was in a delegation on an exploration uh, visit uh, to know a little bit more on this new energy policy of the new administration in Washington. And we, we had a meeting with think tanks. I put this a little bit in uh, quotation marks, this think tanks, because one of these think tanks was the Heritage Foundation and the person responsible for energy policy uh, within this Heritage Foundation. You must know that Heritage Foundation gave a lot of advice in the last 10 years to Mr. Trump. Uh, for example, Heritage Foundation uh, wrote the uh, uh, proposal for the budget, for the new budget in the US. And we discussed uh, energy policy, uh, and uh, there were a lot, a lot of doubts concerning climate change, whether it's real. And uh, 
during this discussion, I said to this person, hey, I think you North Americans are a little bit more far away than the Europeans to um, this uh, possible some hundred million refugees climbing, uh, uh, coming to due to climate change from Africa to Europe. So I can understand that you are a little bit in distance. And first, he didn't understand what I meant with climate change refugees. And then when he realized this, he said, hey, we had a disaster, a heat disaster in Arizona. So there was a heat period, and uh, the solution was that the people switched on their air conditioners. So I, 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 will, not, I will not comment on this, but this was, this was very, very impressive for me. Ladies and gentlemen, this understanding of climate change, of climate change research, is rather new. When John Chelnumer found, founded the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research a quarter century ago, the knowledge that human activities contribute to climate change was still fragmented. Let us remember briefly in, 2000, in, in 1992, the Earth Summit Rio, was already mentioned, was just taken place and uh, the IPCC has just been established. In retrospect, John Schellenhuber did the best that could have happened to us. He teamed outstanding scientists from around the world and from natural social economic disciplines in order to analyze the complex Earth system, the nature-human interactions and its impact on ecological, economic and social systems, always under the premise to provide knowledge-based information for sustainable development. Today, the pig belongs to the best climate think tanks, and there are no quote, uh, quotation marks, uh, <laughs> worldwide. And we, the Leibniz Association, are really happy and proud to have the pig on board. As you all know, next week, John Schellenhuber will be awarded, together with, with Gretchen Daly, with the Blue Planet Prize, the most important international environmental prize sponsored by the Asai Glass Foundation in Tokyo. I'm particularly pleased about this and want to give you, dear colleague, once more my congratulations. We shall have, we, we shall um, uh, still have occasion to celebrate this duly. And as a former DFG president, I'm uh, more proud of this because uh, the only other German uh, uh, having uh, got this prize was uh, um, um, Eugen Seibold, the former DFG president. For this out outstanding research, it needed also an adequate academic spirit and institutional framework. All this was founded here at the Telegra Telegrafenberg in Potsdam in the, in the best way. Beside the, let me say, human resources, of course, it is essential to mention the role of an ex excellent research infrastructure for the scientific work. Just look at the data analysis and numerical simulation experiments and model development, which belongs to the main business of the PIC. It would be unthinkable without adequate information and communication technology infrastructure for high performance computing. I myself, about two years ago, have inaugurated the new research building in which also the new high-performance computer is housed. Here, politics must continue to ensure that this excellent research with such high relevance for the society will continue to be possible without financial constraints. Of course, as the president of the Leibniz Association, I will do my best to convince the new German government whatever it may look like, for the necessity of a reliable and long-term focused funding for research and development. Let me come back to talk about the characteristics of the PIC, which are, by the way, in very good accordance uh, with those of the Leibniz Association and its member. I already mentioned, and John Chelnhuber uh, showed it to us, the interdisciplinary approach and the high societal relevance of the research at the PIC. 
As you know, the PIC stands for the Development of Science-Based Scenarios and Recommendations to policymakers and for other stakeholders. I'm convinced that the Leibniz Association is a unique place for this collaborative work at cross boundaries. The Leibniz Asso Association with uh, their 91 member institutes stands with its competence in social, economic, natural and life sciences in, en in engineering and humanities for interdisciplinary research, for collaborative science and for the combination of excellent research with high societal relevance. One of the main strategic goals of the Leibniz Association is to foster research across disciplines by various activities. Alone the PIC, which was very successful within the Leibniz competition, has raised almost 7 million euros in such uh, mechanisms of the Leibniz Association. Uh, in the last 10 years in this field of climate impact research. These projects uh, addresses interdisciplinary collaborations with our Leibniz Institutes and with other partners such as universities from agriculture, social and economic sciences as well as with biodiversity research. These projects focus on the relationship between human climate change and land use changes migration, urbanization, and economic growth, all research topics which are still rather poorly known, just to give you an example. So finally, I would say there is no doubt that the world would urgently need a PIC if it didn't already exist. Let me name a few reasons. Without the PIC, politics, economics, um, uh, and citizens worldwide would have less awareness for one of the most pressing challenges of the day, the challenge to mitigate human climate change and to find solutions for adaptation strategies in a global warming world. The PIC tirelessly shows the world the vulnerability of the Earth system. We all know how difficult the implementation of the Climate Action Plan is. Today, man mankind would be much less prepared against climate warming if the PIC did not exist. This is the great merit of this institute and of course of John Chellenhuber. I would like to add a wish. Um, you should be able to stop your work as soon as possible. <laughs> but up to, up to this point in the, I would say, not near future, I wish the utmost success for the PIC and uh, that it continues to have, a, have so much impact on the decision making with regard to sustainable development. Dear colleagues, dear conference participants, I wish you also every success for your conference and not least furthermore inspiring and productive discussions during the last sessions tomorrow. Unfortunately, I, leave to, I have to leave very soon with the minister because we have a second 25th anniversary here in Potsdam of the Leibniz Institute uh, for Contemporary uh, uh, History. So again, thank you very much, all people from PIC, thank you very much for your attention and good luck and take care. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias Kleiner. It sounds like 25 years ago something was in the water. So we are now going to hear a, an address remotely from the European Commissioner for Research, Science and Innovation, Carlos Moedas. And Carlos Moedas is really a trailblazer of science-based policy action in Europe, having recently convened the high-level panel on decarbonisation, of which John Schellenhuber is indeed a member. Hello. And I'm sorry I could not be with you today at this event, where you will work to answer some of climate change's most pressing questions. This conference also marks 25 years of the Postum Institute for Climate Impact Research. Much has changed since 1992, when your institute was created. Now, climate change is a top priority in many parts of the world. And I want to thank and congratulate Professor Sheldon Huber 
for leading this institute and for achieving so much in the fight against climate change. Over the next three days, you'll get to grips with the economics of climate change, how it affects our health and how it drives migration. A warming planet affects us in many ways, so our solutions must be equally holistic. As a politician, I'm utterly committed to doing what I can and to convincing others to join us. But I rely on experts like you to guide me in the best ways to do this, to advise me where we should invest and what will create the most added value. This is why I'm so glad that Professor Sheldon Huba is leading the European Commission's high level on decarbonisation pathways. This panel will tell us how research and innovation can lead the transition to a zero carbon economy. We will use this advice to define a clear climate mission under the next framework program. A mission-based approach will better connect with citizens and will help to create more impact. At the end of October, we will launch our work program for 2018 to 2020. Here, we will focus on a low-carbon, climate-resilient future. I hope that many of you will take up the challenge and join in this work. Europe is the world leader in climate change research and in the creation of technologies and solutions to mitigate it. I hope that this conference will continue these strong traditions and I wish you a productive and lively three days ahead. Thank you. So we've come to our final address from this very special and yeah, um, inspiring session. We're going to hear now from a Nobel Prize winner, Klaus von Klitzing. He received the Nobel Prize in 1985. He's a physicist and he discovered the quantum Hall effect. And pretty amazing, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got his own constant. It's, does anyone know which constant that is? Whoa. <laughs> We're going to have to find out. Thanks, Klaus von Klissing. Welcome to the last talk at this special session for this birthday. And I'm an outsider. I'm a physicist in a certain way, like Professor Sharon Huber. And therefore, I will start with the most famous physicist. It's not Sharon Huber, no. I, we are here in the hotel, and just opposite the Einstein house, and Einstein lived here, and 85 years ago, you could see him on the sailing boat here on the lake, and thinking about physics. <laughs> now, there's not only the Einstein house, you should visit it, all our foreign visitors, the Schloss Sanssouci, and if you run too fast, you may end up in this place, and I discovered there's something strange from Klitzing Street, <laughs> and... <laughs> I was surprised I heard this for the first time, so I called the town hall, and the first reaction was, you are still alive? <laughs> <laughs> because the rules here in Potsdam says it's not allowed that a living person has a street, <laughs> and in order to demonstrate that they're still alive, I accepted your invitation to come <laughs> here and to say something about this title. Now, I'm not a specialist in climate change, but it was announced that I'm not a specialist, I'm Nobel laureate, and you know, Nobel laureate knows everything. <laughs> At least some people believe it. It's not true. This is not true. But as a director of the Max Planck Institute, I have perhaps the privilege to be an independent scientist. I do not depend on external funding. If a Max Planck director is appointed, he has a scientific funding until the end of his scientific career. I'm absolutely independent. If I'm a lobbyist, I'm just a lobbyist for our future. And, uh, okay. <laughs> and stand up for science. You could see here this demonstration, ice has no agenda, it just melts. And I think 
in a time where we entered the post-truth politics, we need trust in science and in facts. This was this year meeting of Nobel laureates. Every year we have Nobel laureates in Lindau. And Nobel Prize winner Mario Molina from Mexico, yes. They were the host last year. I made this picture when he showed this picture here, scientific evidence, a scientist convinced. And 97% of climate scientists think climate change is significantly due to human activities. But there's still three black sheep here. And uh, <laughs> Professor Shane Huber told us last night he had the experience, he was sitting there, here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> he was the only one really for science, but he are journalists against climate change, and even politicians, okay, in gray, uh, half and half, yes. <laughs> but I think we as a scientist, first of all, climate change is real, and at this conference, I think everyone starts already that climate change is real, and climate change has more negative than positive impacts this is the main, main part of this conference to demonstrate this in such a complicated system as climate. I will concentrate more that global actions are necessary to control the origin of climate change. And perhaps scientists, and perhaps also astronauts, are cosmopolitan, they know a little bit about everything in the world, and I will tell you a short story. I met a long time ago Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon, and he gave a talk, and he said, when I saw the Earth with a very thin oxygen layer, a small ball floating in the dark universe, I discovered for the first time that the U.S. is not in the center of the universe. <laughs> And then he said, now I feel more responsible for the Earth as a whole. And in this meeting, we coined the phrase, all leading politicians should be sent on the moon before <laughs> taking office. <laughs> I, I showed this last time in the United States, this picture, and somebody said, okay, Perhaps it's a one-way ticket. Or <laughs> <laughs> now, what is the origin of many problems? The origin of the problems is, if you have to go with population, billions here, you see this spike. And as a physicist, immediately you see, okay, this is an anomaly. This is something which is dangerous, the resonance or some chaos or disorder. These are the population in billions. And Stephen Hawkins, famous, you showed the picture of him, he made the recommendation that we must escape Earth within 100 years if humans are to survive. It's absolutely non-realistic. We have no chance that in 100 years we can escape. So we have to live on Earth. So, uh, overpopulation, climate change, was one of the reasons that he made this statement. Now, indeed, climate change is... Risk number one. There was a World Economic Forum Global Risk Report, 750 experts, and they came to the conclusion it's a complicated system, but climate change is one, number one in the risks of the future. There are many other risks, the cyber dependency or increasing polarization of societies, rising income, wealth disparities. There are a lot of problems, but this was identified as number one. And therefore, we have this meeting. We will discuss what sustainability science should do in the future. And I think the United Nations, these goals, everyone knows this. Finally, we want to have no poverty. And I will focus, and I think the number seven is a very, very important part. Affordable and clean energy I think we can solve many, many problems if we have clean and cheap energy. Because if you look at all the problems, if you have enough energy, you can solve them. And I agree with the former, uh, okay, no, 
Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, he pointed out that energy, preferable electrical energy, is not only the driving force of economic wealth, but it's also necessary for a decent living in a world with increasing population. So electrical energy, if we have cheap, clean energy, we can solve many, many problems. And as a physicist, I think I have some connection to this. So this is once more the curve, population, and the amount of energy increases proportional to this. And you know that at present, oil, coal is the main part for this energy. Two-thirds of world's electrical energy used today is generated by burning fossil fuels. This is fact. We destroy a reservoir of coal, oil, and natural gas within some hundred years, which was built up in 70 million years. So this is a mismatch in the time constant by million, approximately. <laughs> this is not sustainable. This alone, I think, is the reason that we should not burn this reservoir. In this meeting, the summer of Nobel Prize winners, I saw this nice picture. You know, most of you know this. The CO2 for the past 10,000 years, and here this spike. This is CO2. And most of you know these measurements done in Hawaii. And I think this curve influenced me about 20 years ago that I really should look at the impact of humans. These are really the measurements, the oscillations, summer and winter, the, these oscillations. And these are very accurate data. You have not only this increase curves, you can have all kinds of other curves also. The Arctic ice extent decrease as a function of time, minus 7% per decade. This is a drastic change in the ice, the Arctic ice. But there are always problem if you confront the public with such data, then some specialists say, okay, but I have to be Antarctic sea so ice extent increase by 1.5%. So this is a confusion. Okay, there's an increase. You are telling something what you want to tell. Therefore, climate impact research is very important. I found in the publication of the Institute, of all it sounds paradoxical, rising temperature might result in more snowfall in Antarctica. This is science. You have to solve the complex problem, and this was a result of an international team of scientists led by the Potsdam Institute. So it's not easy very often to transfer these complicated connections into the public. And they found always some argument which looks simple, but nothing is simple in such a complicated research like climate. This is a also nice Detailed experiments, the maximum intent of the sea ice shrinking 40,000 square kilometers per year. This is the Arctic sea ice. And I know that Professor Schellenhuber, he showed these pictures also at the Vatican, said, okay, what, what is with these curves? We have a linear curve. Maybe that we're already bending down. Do we have nonlinear intensification? Where are the tipping points? In science, it's very dangerous to have positive feedback, and then you cannot control it. So I think this is the biggest fear, that in this unknown world, we reach some tipping points where a runaway effect happens. So we never know exactly what this complicated system is doing in the future. We know exactly that we cannot stop this increase, what we measured, but a radical change is necessary within the next years. Now, what is the origin so if you have an infrared camera, you would immediately see C2 emission from power station, C2 emission from the cars. And I think if you discuss with the public, perhaps you should ask the question, what do you think about two kilograms of CO2? CO2, very light. Two kilograms of CO2, that's a huge amount of gas. This is just one liter of gasoline burns to two kilograms of CO2. Even scientists very often cannot give the right answer to this question, how much one liter gasoline, how much CO2 is produced. So we are really polluting this traffic, this energy production, such an amount of CO2. 
And you know this picture, where are the biggest emissions, CO2, United States and China at present. But Africa, with the population of China or India, they will come up in South America and India and China, they will grow. And so we have no chance in the near future, really, to stop the increase in the CO2. Germany, we have only some percent of the total amount. But this is not an argument that we should not do something. And 42 percent for energy production. And we have solutions in principle. And I like this picture where we have in this volume here the expected world energy use for 2050. And this volume, this is the production of energy coming from the sun on the earth. Every hour, the sun beams onto earth more than enough energy to satisfy global energy needs for a full year. Each hour for a full year, energy is coming from the sun. We have just to use it. And wind is one of the most famous renewable energy. And as a scientist, I would say, Photovoltaic. Photovoltaic is the most direct way to transform solar energy into electricity. But at the beginning of the century, 2000, less than 0.1% of energy was produced by photovoltaic. This is high tech, was very expensive. And at this time, I had no, no idea that photovoltaic will really take over. But there are big changes, really big changes. If you look at the prediction, 2000 they predicted, OK, but until 2020, uh, we have this increase of photovoltaic. Then the prediction 2010, we will have this in the future. 2012, we will have this in the future. 2015, this in the future. We are now already here. So the next prediction goes even more photovoltaic in the future. So this is really a big change in the last years. But the total amount is still small. You should be very careful. If this is the world total of electrical energy, here the red is the solar, and this is a logarithmic scale, at this point you have even only percent. This is still a small number compared to the total amount. Therefore, it's a very long way, really, to have finally only the renewable energies. And the driving force was really the price the price for modules for photovoltaic went down this time drastically. So this is really as a function of time. And the amount of silicon, 2008, more silicon wafers were used for solar cells than for microelectronic devices. And silicon is still the driving force in this field. But there is a lot of research going on. Uh, and now we are reaching the coal, natural gas, cost band, so solar energy can compete already today with the cost of coal and gas. So this is a result, and therefore a positive outlook, Trump's coal revival plan wouldn't work, clean energy tech is already cheaper, the cost of solar power system has dropped 30 percent this year alone. So therefore it's some hope that really this argument will really drive the future of clean energy. And the reason is that really the price went down, that's the red curve and the blue curve is the global solar panel installation. So we are now in the region, and last year the price went down to less than 0.447 dollar, and therefore we have this increase. And this is a plot for the research. In science, we are trying to increase the efficiency of solar cells, goes up to 47%. And you know, perovskite, all kinds of new materials are uh, investigated. Uh, and here, the most sophisticated solar cell where we can use all parts of the solar spectrum, but it's very expensive devices where we have uh, so called tandem cells with three different materials which have an efficiency of more than 46%. But we are still here in the rising curve. We are just beginning. Uh, of the global growth curve, and we should be aware that a fast ramp up 
needs conventional energy to produce this. And as long as we are doing this in China, Chinese CO2 emission will be drastically increased. I have these curves, and you see the red part is China, because they are doing all these energy efficient productions using coal. Every week they build up a new coal factory. Now there are strong regulations, they stopped some of them, and China is, I think, maybe the driving force to think about really the future, but there is still a long way to go. So therefore, everyone was happy and about Paris, 79 Nobel Prize winner, contributed to this by signing some petition, and I have here a picture from the Minow Declaration of Climate Change, where I signed here and here Stephen Chu, the Energy Secretary under Obama, or Serge Aroche from uh, Paris. He gave it to Hollande to present this to the uh, Paris Agreement. And this is the main, minor declaration 2015 on climate change. And only two times in the last 60 years, Nobel Prize winners wrote a declaration. This was about 60 years ago. On my now, a similar gathering of Nobel laureates in science issued a declaration of the dangers in end to the newly found technology of nuclear weapons. And this year, you know, the Peace Prize went to these activities, and we believe that our world today faces another threat of comparable magnitude, and this is the climate change. So therefore, we signed this and hoped we have some impact also, and I will just mention at the end, by Stephen Shu, he gave a keynote, and I think you should read here these sentences because this is important for the future, and it's called Science as an Insurance Policy to the Risk of Climate Change. There are numerous technologies developments needed before clean energy becomes the low-cost option for all our energy needs. Science is part of the solution, but we also need stable, long-term policies to fund visionary research and development. Policies are also need to guide the private sector investment needed to turn discovery and invention into wide-scale development deployment. Now, more than ever, we need talented young scientists, and we have many of them here, and engineers to create the innovations needed for a prosperous and sustainable future. We also need young economists and political scientists to work with the technologists to create better policy op options and future business leaders that will make sustainability an integral part of our business. And you see, there are enough problems to be solved to keep big busy for the next 25 years. And perhaps I will just say happy birthday <laughs> to you. So thanks, Klaus von Flissing, for um, ending our session in such an entertaining way. I have a l tiny housekeeping matter. Mr. Noy ordered a taxi, and there's a big traffic jam, so you need to go very soon. Sorry. But before you go, I think I've been told there's time for you to watch the film. So the very final element of, um, of this session is a small film. And we have the opportunity over the last two days and tomorrow again to sit together in one room because we've flown across the world to do so. But we don't always have the chance to fly across the world, so we communicate with each other via papers. So we're going to fly together now for four minutes with a few paper planes. If our climate were a machine, working in perfect synchronicity to make our planet habitable, then the excessive carbon dioxide that we emit would be the loose screw, putting it all in jeopardy. But what does that mean? 
the climate is so complex. Unraveling and understanding it is, well, not easy. Fortunately, there are quite a lot of climate experts who know how it's done. The Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, for instance. It is a pioneer in calculating climate changes and their various impacts with its supercomputer. Okay, they also have pretty super scientists from all over the world and all kinds of scientific backgrounds. Their interdisciplinary insights provide all of us with sound information. Because the point is, we need to know what's going on to make informed decisions. Only then can we actually make them. The Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research analyzes how much we have loaded the dice of our climate. Global warming is messing with our planet's ice masses, making sea levels rise, and increasing the probabilities of extreme weather events. That means heavier rainfalls, as well as more severe heat waves. Now that is bad weather. These conditions can put harvests at risk, and if unabated, might not only destabilize economies, but also drive social inequalities. And, in places already experiencing political or social tensions, additional climate stress can trigger conflicts and contribute to migration. We are truly pushing things to the edge. And if we keep pushing and pushing and, you know, just push things too far, we find ourselves beyond tipping points. We might face a hardly imaginable future. On a brighter note, though, when the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research calculates possible future scenarios, it is also working on sustainable solutions. And because people have actually listened to the many climate experts worldwide, historic milestones like the Paris Climate Agreement have been put in place. Based on scientific insights, countries all over the world agreed to work on keeping global warming to well below two degrees. That's pretty cool. And while politics is finally beginning to catch up, research and science is speeding things up in other areas. Think economy and finance. We could divest money and move towards and beyond clean technology solutions. Smarter power grids and more flexible networks could make volatile renewable energy supplies more stable. Putting a price on carbon dioxide emissions could prevent our atmosphere from being used as a free waste dump. And yes, our lifestyle needs a makeover, because nothing is more on vogue than saving the planet. The Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research is right at the forefront of identifying problems and developing solutions. They tell it like it is. So, let's act on the facts. once more the, um, the list of very honourable guests that we've heard from this evening um, and then we will go on to the birthday party so a birthday party isn't complete without something to eat, something to drink and something to dance to.